Shalom. We're continuing on. This is Malachizadak Israel. Um, this is part two to claim your property for free. Um, we're going to continue on where we left off with understanding the deed of trust, which um, establishes the grantor and the grantee on the instrument. Um, remember, there's about four different things going on. There's the um, deed of trust, which you know creates the grantor and um, trustee, or the grantor and grantee. Um, there's also the mortgage, which is dealing with the secured party creditor, which is a trustee, and also the debtor, so-called borrower, the one making the pledge in the mortgage security agreement. There's also the note, which is the asset, which makes you the maker, and them a payee. And there's also the letter of credit, which you are applicant, you know, which pretty much starts the whole thing, the application to apply for credit, um, and they extend it to you in the form of the promissory note, you know, sent together to the treasury. So um, the only thing is that you did not acknowledge it. So um, we got to understand what the deed is, though, um, because there's a trust established, you know what I'm saying? And um, there's original people on that trust, on that document. And third party interveners cannot necessarily interfere with your deed of trust so or your title even to your car even if you don't pay um, in Federal Reserve liability notes but um, in chapter 4 understanding the deed of trust so who owns the deed to your house while you have a mortgage with the bank who owns the deed to your house while you have a security agreement with the bank what did you really get? Most people think the bank does. They don't. That's actually wrong. The bank cannot own property unless acquired through a foreclosure process. So there are laws against this. So you own your property. You own your property. That's who owns the deed to your house because your name is on it even if you don't have the document in your hand. It's on record that you're the owner. You can establish your claim as holder in due course and entitled party to your estate, to your house, to whatever you're claiming is, is yours and you. So this was conveyed to you when you brought the house, usually through a warranty deed. The warranty deed is a deed of trust. And it's a warranty, a uh, clear title, fee simple. A lodeo title almost that makes you you know clear title they do hold uh, title checks and all that stuff to make sure if, if the title is clear or if it's clouded if there's a break in the chain of title or if it's you know I'm um, copacetic so this deed is proof that you own the house so that deed is all you need It's what proves that you own the house like your title to your car is enough to prove that you own the car a true sale does it involve someone coming and saying, hey, they stole that from me? Unless someone's playing some wicked game. But, you know, other than that, if someone sold you something, they sell you it with the title, right? And make sure you always get the title of whatever you get. You know, your children, birth certificate, car title, house title, whatever other title. Make sure that you get it. Because it's what's going to establish the claim to everything. Forget everything else. So this deed is proof that you own the house. So in the real estate business, title is king. Title is king. So title means everything. He with title is in control because they're in control of the title. Like a copyright and trademark. This is your business. So when you signed your loan document at closing, so-called loan, which was just a pledge, um, a security agreement. You signed two important documents, a promissory note, which is the asset, and a deed of trust, which is proof of title. So a promissory note, which is like a dollar bill or money, is simply a promise to pay someone some amount. It has four components. Lender, which is you, borrower, a date, and an amount. Technically, this is wrong. In a promissory note, there are only three people involved. According to UCC3, negotiable instrument, is the, uh, which we call the maker of the note, 
the payee of the note and the drawee of the note. You see them three. So it's the one giving the money or making the promise and the person receiving the promise or receiving the money and the bank which the money is coming from. It's three in one action like the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So a lender and borrower is in a security agreement in a mortgage. So they got this part wrong. A lender and borrower. A lender would be a secure party creditor. Borrower would be a debtor. Because now they owe this, this so-called lender or creditor for what the lender or creditor lended or credited to them. But you, they never lent you anything or credited you anything. And they can't prove that they drew the funds out of their own accounts. But there's proof that you executed a promissory note which made you a maker in another event. You know what I'm saying? And made you an actual creditor in a sense. And this is what was supposed to extinguish the borrowing. That so-called borrowing. You know, they really was a middleman. They truly don't deserve any nickel at all. Except 50 bucks for just recording my documents into the record for me. Because that's all they're doing is using the record. So if you use the record right and you demonstrate that you understand what you're saying and doing and you put the right documents where it need to be, you can work the system. You see? So and you have a right to because you're under the system to a degree or your legal person is, your tax entity is, your juristic person is, your so called straw man legal fiction is, the all caps name is, but you the living breathing spirit dwelling in this flesh and blood is beyond their system but under their system this is the law so it has four components so essentially you created a trust which was the security agreement the mortgage a pledge and you appointed someone to manage that trust for you <clears throat> which is the secure party creditor that person is called a trustee. So what? What's a trust? Trust. What's what's trust is a question. What's a trustee? Can I trust him? How can I know which one to trust? So a trust comes from rich European history when owners, lords have estates. Like landlord, landowners, landmasters. Hold on one second, loves. So, as a title owner, as a title owner, you are a landlord. You own your land. You own your soil. No one else own it. So you appoint a trustee to look after your estate. That's why it's a trust. And you put the house into the trust to protect the house. Also too to pay off te the, um, tax and debt. So including the ability to liquidate your estate. Which means to turn your house into money. If you fail to pay your loan like a collateral that's a collateral section and a default clause and a security agreement which you're giving a security as a pledge to fulfill some obligation but they never gave you anything once again so thus a foreclosure sale is often called a trustee sale because it is a sale conducted by the trustee so let's look at this again when you signed your closing documents who created the trust? You did, although they gave you the paper, but you signed it. So who appointed the trustee? You did, and you control them. You can remodify things, change them, terminate things, rescind those signatures, revoke things, you know, and cancel things. It's all in your power as the grantor, the one with the power, the one that they need and want in order to feed. Who appointed the trustee? Who can appoint trustees? Do you have a successor trustee? Who can be your trustee? Anyone you appoint? It better be someone you appoint and they're competent of the task. 
Remember, you can contact me at God Lives in Our Heart at hotmail.com. 1, 2, 3 p.m. Hallelujah. So, who can grant additional trustees? You can. Who can fire a trustee? You can. Is that legal? Can you really do that? The answer to that is a qualified yes. Do your own research. If a trustee is not doing his or her job, then you can fire him, especially if they're not adding your asset to your liability. Just like an employee, that's why they're a trustee. So in general, you must have at least one trustee in a trust and you can fire him or substitute him as you see fit. So remember, you are the landlord. You are the God of your land, the owner of your land. All praise be to Yah, God of gods and King of kings, Lord of lords. So let's go back to my process. I asked the bank two times to prove that they are the rightful owner of the note, right? And two times they failed. They did not respond. They agreed by tacit acquiescence that I have a point. That is enough proof that they don't have the note and have no claim on the property. Or they would have asserted it. Because they'd be like, oh, I got the papers right here. What you talking about? They don't got it. So they don't talk about nothing. They're into silence. That means they agree. Or they don't want to lie. So let's talk about this concept of standing and party of interest. So courts are made to resolve controversies, complaints, lawsuits. Someone accuses, which is the plaintiff, someone else, a defendant, of something, the controversy, subject, matter. But they need jurisdiction which must be established through contract or some proof, manifest proof. So in order for the two parties to have standing in the controversy, they must be able to show that they have interest in the matter. So in other words, if a man and wife were arguing in court for a divorce, and some guy shows up and say, I want that TV, that third party has no standing. Mm. Yeah, because they he talking about TV and they talking about divorce. So we have no standing. They talk about two different things. But if that third guy can produce a receipt that says the wife already sold the TV to him, then he can prove that he is a party of interest. If they're arguing over the TV and stuff. Hmm. So this point is very important. So conversely, if a party cannot prove that they are a party of interest, then they have no standing, fail, failure to prove a, a claim upon which relief can be granted. So then they have no standing, like the first example. Then they have no right to the controversy. They have no business being there. Patent versus Dimer. This is the this the court case or uh, case law. <clears throat> so if the bank cannot and have not been able to prove that they are a party of interest in the contract, then they have no standing to do anything to you. This is the most important point. Let's walk through the scenario again. One, the bank did not actually lend you any money. They just created money out of thin air. This means they are not practicing generally accepted accounting principles. Almost every, almost every business in the world recognizes this standard. It's also called double entry bookkeeping. If I credit one side, I must debit another side to balance the book. If I credit one side, I must debit another side to balance the books. If they didn't debit anything, then they cannot say they are a creditor. Because debit means to give, to put. You are the ones who credited. Was credited and debited. 
and they receive money like credit. <clears throat> you debited and they credited. So I mean when you are the one debiting, someone else is getting paid. But with banks, you don't want to be the one putting in. You want to be the one taking out. You see? So you want to be on the credit side. Because then they would, you would be the one creating the credit and they would be the one being debited. You see? They would be, you would be the one actually receiving the credit and they would be the one debiting. When you're debiting, they're the one crediting. So whoever got the credit side is the one who got the money, the asset. The debit side is who has the liability. So when you have an overdraft, that's actually a good thing because then that a activates the asset, the um, credit side of the books. Overdraft means you're making some more money orders, more credit, overdraft, over credit, you're crediting. When you're debiting, you're putting in. And when you're crediting, you're taking out. Whoever got the credit side is the one who don't have the debit side. And whoever has the debit side is not the one who has the credit side. So every time you do take money out of the bank, that's like credit. And they're debiting to you what they owe you. Every time you're putting into the bank, you're debiting. And they're, cre they're being credited with what you put in. So take out more than put in. Then put in to get more out. You want to get in the habit of taking out more than putting putting in. And it is oh, ideable, though, taking out. So if they say this, then they are committing perjury. So in that carries a five-year sentence and fines. If they didn't debit anything, then they cannot say they are a creditor. If they say they are a creditor then they are committing perjury they are lying because on even though in the security agreement they wrote you down as a, a borrower or a debtor in themselves as creditor a loaner it's a lie because they never lent you anything you created a promissory note to pay off the debt it's called the mortgage backed security it's a liability already backed by the asset which is the note to offset the account and adjust the balance books but they fail to do that, which is misappropriation of fund and breach of trust. Because that security agreement also creates a trust or a lien. So the lien is, is, is pretty much meltdown. It's null and void. So they're committing perjury by saying they're a creditor when they were a payee of a note. So no banker would ev ever touch this. They sold the note and got paid at least two times. Hypothecation and then rehypothecation, then leverage. Once by Wall Street and the second by you through the bailout. So they don't have possession of the note because it was sold, misplaced, fractionalized, and monetized. Facts are it's gone. You'll never get that original note again. No one ever has. So when you ask them to prove that they have any of the above, they can't. Therefore, they are not a party of interest and have no standing in the case almost all the time. So the trustee. So going back to the trustee question, can you fire the trustee? Technically, yes. But if you have lawful reasons to fire the trustee, then neither the bank nor the trustee can come after you. If you have lawful reasons to fire the trustee, to terminate the contract, then neither the bank nor the trustee can come after you. So the lawful reason comes from the bank's inability to produce valid proof of claim. The lawful reason comes from the bank's inability inability to produce valid proof of claim once that claim is established you can do anything you want and they cannot say anything about it that's the source of your strength and power establishing your claim perfecting your claim do you have a claim they claim you did this what do you claim do you counter claim or no claim what do you claim this is just what I claim, so I don't know what you claim. But I proclaim that this is the truth, though, if you understand the power of claims. 
but that's what I claim so prove it so the truth a truth once established cannot be disputed like an affidavit of fact it's like standing on solid foundation hallelujah so the trustee have an important function in administering your trust you have you have given him or her what's called the power of attorney a nominee trustee power of attorney to represent you technically so the power to act on your behalf on behalf of the straw man so this means the trustee can do what's called a deed of reconveyance because he's a fiduciary and power of attorney she can do or he can do this usually when the note is satisfied in full which it has been or in your case if it was discovered that the note was invalid or fraudulent so as the truster creator grantor of the trust you have the power to give your trustee instructions remodification you can modify it too in which they must obey remember she or he works for you you are the landlord yes so how do I how I did it so let's review the process again I asked the two I asked the bank two times through administrative procedure to provide proof of claim they failed therefore there is absolutely no way they can dispute this again this is ironclad evidence I've included my first two letters in appendix D out of 24 ironclad evidence I then notified the bank that I, that because I discovered this mistake I intend to modify the deed of trust to reflect this mistake making the balance O to zero I also modified them that I will be revoking I also notified them that I will be revoking the power of attorney I granted them and the trustee so I then did a substitution of trustee appoint your own trustee in other words I fired their trustee and appointed my own trustee someone I trust that's why it's called a trust so I gave the bank three days to dispute my offer they remained silent the offer stands after three days according to the Truth in Lending Act so I notified the bank of their default through a notice of default or a notice of non-response another offer which is another offer again so giving them three days to dispute my offer <coughs> since you're already in default by this point <coughs> so see the pattern offer then counter offer then rebuttal offer then counter offer and rebuttal so first you offered them to provide the truth they defaulted so you counter offered them since they had sent you an offer do you want a contract now that you had sent me this stuff for no reason and you injured me and then or a rebuttal so offer and rebuttal if they reply or offer and counter offer or counterclaim so a claim then a counterclaim or a rebuttal so you can counter claim you can object and you can rebut claims you see and remember we're dealing with claims so let's extinguish it from the root not from the leaves so after the notice of default I then notified my trustee that the note has been false and made null and void so I instructed her to then do a full reconveyance grant the trust back to me and close up the trust so I take this to the county recorder's office and uh, and record these documents for official record like I said put it in the official record done the house is now free and clear so technically the bank can do cannot do anything to the house from this point on 
but to further protect our interests, I put another step to further remove them from their claim. So to illustrate this, let me give you an example. If I went down to the real estate agent's office, right, and offered to sell your house, not mine, what do you think would happen? He would tell me to shove off, rightly so, because it's not your house, you can't sell it. So well, that's the same thing we will be doing. We will be conveying the title to the property to another party, a trust or an LLC of our election, and control through a warranty deed. We can create our own warranty deed, warranty deed of trust. So reconstruct the deed of trust, reconstruct the note. It's like you remodifying your own trust. You have the you have the power to do that as a grantor, trustor, employer. It's you're the boss. They're getting their paycheck from you. So spend your money wisely. Some things are unnecessary. So let me illustrate the picture. Trustee elected by the bank, George Tran, landlord, LLC, new owner. So now this court get cut off and is between him and them now. Because the bank elected their own trustee. They didn't need to elect a trustee for you. You can choose whatever trustee you want in the world. You didn't have to make it be the banks. But they put their own people there because then they can infiltrate with their trustee which worked for them. And the bank ended up being beneficiary. So technically, after we choose a new trustee, we can eventually choose a new beneficiary as well. You see who's going to benefit from this, and it can be you. And actually, where there is not a beneficiary disclosed, the beneficiary is the grantor. You just cannot be a, a, a beneficiary and trustee. So appoint someone next to you who know a little bit about law, a little bit about trusts and accounting and things like that this is not legal advice and then go ahead and um, appoint them as a trustee over the trust and then choose uh, put yourself as beneficiary by proclaiming and declaring your 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 uh, your your beneficiary status and who you appoint as successor trustee after the last trustee which was you know before who you appoint now so if I grant ownership title from George Tran to the LLC, then can the trustee sell the house that belongs to the LLC? Isn't it just like me going down to the real estate agent trying to sell a house I don't own? It can't be done. So if someone tries to sell your house that they don't own, do you think you would have some choice words to say to that person? If the bank tries to, I knew it, I knew this is what he was going to do. If the bank tries to sell a, a house they don't own, do you think the new owner have the right to give notice to the bank? The only recourse at this point for the bank is to file a quiet title action to remove the LLC as the new owner back to the bank. This is a tedious and futile exercise because a quiet title action lawsuit requires all the parties to be quiet. So do you think you will quietly let the bank take your property at this point? Even if they have already proven they have no standing. Besides, don't they have hundreds of thousands of other houses they can steal from other sheeples? It's just too much hassle to deal with an informed homeowner who have exerted his rights. Conclusion. My question to you is, do you think do you still think you should be making payments to these guys? No. If so, then read on. I know it takes a while to wrap your mind around the concept. If not, then let me show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. So we've shown that the bank cannot produce proof of claim. If they cannot produce proof of claim, then they have no standing in the administrative process nor judicial process via the court. If they try to sue you, 
you can simply send the court a motion to dismiss for lack of standing. So just show them your documents and process as evidence. Boom. That's a nutshell right there. Motion to dismiss for lack of standing and show them your documents and process as evidence or the proof. Administrative process. Case dismissed. Bam. If they have no claim on your house, especially if you ask, does anybody here have a claim on me? Or my house or my stuff? Why are you paying them? You shouldn't be paying them. They're thieves. They're liars. Would you pay someone who stole your car? No. You say, give me that. That's my car. I don't feel no remorse or bad for you. That's mine. You know? Don't feel bad for the criminal. Please. They don't deserve no peace. They deserve hell for every people they robbed. Especially old people and immigrants and stuff like that. Although I'm an immigrant on this land too because I'm not American. I'm a Hebrew Israelite. I'm an Aisian. So my desire is to teach and inform you of your rights. La d'un pays d'espoir. And show you how to take back what is rightfully yours. And more importantly, give you information so that you can own the process and be able to stand on your own two feet or four legs like a table. And hopefully teach others get profoundly rooted into the truth. So questions. Who else have done this? Take a look at a small list of case law in Appendix C. Question. Will I be required to go to court to defend myself? Most likely not. This is almost entirely an administrative process, prejudicial and non-judicial, but it can become useful judicially. But you're entering a whole new paradigm when you're dealing with judicial. Now you gotta understand civil law, criminal law, and proper procedures and know how to motion and make sure everyone's notified and know how to properly so-called represent yourself or be of yourself in propia persona versus pro se you see so it is a paper exchange paper exchange entirely administrative title five now if if they, if they bank, if the bank be stupid enough to bring legal action against you, then that's when the fun begins. Because now you can sue them, counterclaim for even more, take advantage of the courtroom. I'd be like, oh, no, 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 you should have never opened this case. We're not shutting nothing down. We're taking it to the end, and I'm going to take you down. I'm going to destroy your life in this courtroom tonight. That's how you got to think, because they're thinking that way about you like loan sharks. You know what I mean? So am I crazy, fun, or what the fun? So here's the deal. If you go through this administrative process, they are cooked. Done. They have no recourse. You bring the evidence before the judge. And the judge will have to compel the bank to proof up motion for discovery the judge will review your process administrative process to make sure it follows proper federal rules of civil procedure guidelines if your process sticks they have nowhere to turn or run they cannot run flee so the fun is then you get to counter sue for three times the damages punitive damages including three times the amount of the loan, hallelujah, they just admitted fraud in front of everyone because they could not prove the contrary. They're guilty until proven innocent. So what? Fraud? How? It's just like selling a stolen car and taking monthly payments for a car that is not theirs to sell. They knowingly collect m money knowingly collect money from you that is not rightfully theirs to collect. They are harassing you for the money each month. 
with a new contract, with a new bill for the money, even though they know they are not entitled to the money. That's fraud and racketeering. Rico. So chapter five, how sure are you of this process? This is all good and well in theory. It's been interesting and entertaining. What if they don't follow the law and sell your house anyway? What if they ignore everything and dispute everything that you have done? Great questions. These are the same questions I asked as well. I even called my title officer to ask his opinion. Remember, I was a real estate investor. He said, there's no merit to this process. Boy, was I crushed. Here I am building this beautiful thought castle and admiring how great it is only to be laughed at and threatened. He said, if I do this, I could go to jail because I will be fighting both the title company and the bank. So they try to put fear in you to make you afraid. So these guys have lots of money and can hire the best lawyers money can buy. So I had to ask more questions and do more research. I mean, damn. This guy is a title officer. So he does this for a living. He must know this stuff better than me. Actually, he doesn't. He only knows the title process. He is ignorant of the power of the Administrative Procedures Act. Remember, offer, then counter-offer or rebuttal. If no rebuttal or counter-offer is put forth within a given time as allowed by the Federal Rules of Civil Procedures Act, then the claim or offer sticks, tacit acquiescence. Not even a judge can challenge this. If he challenges the Administrative Procedures Act, he will put in jeopardy the entire government procedure. So what about state law and statutes? Where is there a law that requires the bank to prove anything? There's a contract. You signed it. It sticks. Suck it up and be a good little sheeple. That's what my lawyer told me. Yes, I consulted my lawyer too. Boy, was I crushed too. I mean, damn, she's a lawyer. She should know these things. Here's the God's, here's, here's the God's honest truth. Uh, here's the Alehim's honest truth. Amen. You have the right to challenge any claims brought forth against you. There's also in the sixth amendment of their constitution you have the right to face your accuser and to question question the witnesses uh, to know the nature of the crime being um, uh, charged or pressed against you so under the sixth amendment you have the right to face your accuser there must be a corpus delecti uh, injured body or a person in interest and someone with a bona fide claim so it's called habeas corpus you have the right to challenge your accuser. Hmm. Didn't George Bush sign away our constitutional right on this? I'm not sure, but we might be under martial law. So if I said, Bob, you were burned, you 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 burned my house down, then unless I can prove that accusation is just words. Innocent until proven guilty, that's what they say. But there's a contract. A contract can be challenged when you have reason to believe that it is not legitimate. So the only person who can lay claim to the contract is the true note holder in due course. If they cannot prove that they are that person, they have no claim. Because the only person who can lay claim to the contract or instrument is the true note holder in due course. If they cannot prove that they are that person, they have no claim. So as we have seen, 99% of the time they cannot prove that they are the note holder in due course. 
Remember the stolen car example? Let's talk about a contract. A contract has four elements. It is between two parties, which means there's an offer and consideration. It has promises of performance or consideration. It has full disclosure in the meeting of the mind. No hidden agendas. Fully disclose everything to me that you want me to do and how this is going to go. It has a signature consent authorization between the parties of the contract. They're obligated to one another. You and some third party don't. So for example, I hired Bob to do my lawn, right? A. It is between me and Bob. B. If Bob mows my lawn, I will pay him X amount. C. Bob and I know pretty clearly within reason what mow my lawn means. D. If we agree in contract, we both sign it. So what, what's this got to do with your mortgage? Take a close look at your deed of trust. Go ahead, take a close look. Promissory note or closing documents. Close look. Go start digging for those paperwork now. Go look for it. Go ahead. Look for the note. Look for the deed of trust. Look for your closing documents. Put them all in one box, one location. So when they come, you're ready to fight. Do you see your bank's signature on it at all? Nope. Is there full disclosure in the meeting of the mind? Not necessarily because they're speaking mortgage and legal language. I don't speak legal jargon. Legalese. Sure, they will lend me money and I agree to pay, right? That's, that's all it seems like, right? Huh? Wrong. They did not lend you money. It is not their money they are lending at all. They just created the money which is signature. Extension of credit. Did they disclose this to you? No, they did not. Then they're in breach of contract. Non-full disclosure. That's enough to terminate a contract. That's finding uncleanness in the marriage. Like the Bible says. The law of divorce. Or termination of, of relationship. The contract. I dump you. So... <laughs> I don't know why people <laughs> I don't know why people learn that stuff when they were young. Say I dump you. What does I dump you mean? It's over. What's over? Well we just overcame a challenge? <laughs> like you know, like you know when your kids just it's funny. But even when you're a little kid you know how to terminate a relationship. So <laughs> I'm not your friend anymore, <laughs> you know. Like, but as you get older, you get afraid to say this, you know, no contract and stuff like that. But you got to remember, man, we're still students. Everyone. No one knows everything. We all got little pieces here, little pieces there. That's why we talk with each other to kind of figure out what is what. But what is will always be. Let's just find out what it is because it will always be. But, but. If they didn't lend me the money, where did it come from? And who lent it to me then? Actually, you did. You're a debtor and creditor to yourself. But that's another story. I gotta explain that for you to get it. It's called collateralizing of your bond. Collateralizing of your bond. For now, let's not get into that. For now. It's another story. <clears throat> Next paragraph. So here they are creating money out of thin air. In other words, they risk none of their money and charge you interest for this creation from the hard money you make from going to work, which keeps you a slave. So pretty good deal, eh? No. Get someone to pay you for the next 30 years and it costs you nothing but putting all the paperwork in place. That's all they do putting the paperwork in place and you're just paying them all this money each month for nothing they're not even fighting to help you keep your home so that was something I used to think they were doing but they don't you're all by yourself with your home and all 
So if you don't know nothing about real estate and notes, negotiable instruments, security agreements and trusts and accounting, you're going to have some problems. And if you don't know proper procedure in court, civil or criminal or foreclosure or in uh, commercial or trade, then damn, you just stuck. You go ahead and get yourself a lawyer who don't know anything and boom, it's all gone. Just like that. Like a magic act. So you got to watch out with these people, man. And watch what you sign. You might end up selling your soul away. For cheap. You could have at least got a happy meal. I'm playing with you. But don't take my word for it. Read Modern Money Mechanics. Google Bank Money Creation. The banks freely admit to this. Bank money creation. So modern money mechanics is put out by the Federal Reserve. It is their own words. I can't make this stuff up if I want to. On the private side, if I were to lend you money, I have to go to my bank, right? Tell them to debit my account, right? And credit your account, right? Therefore, I am a creditor to your account. Therefore, I am a party of interest and can lay claim on any enforcement action. The bank did not do this. They did it with your social security account. With your signature and your name and your address. And they got your tax history and your credit history and employment history and, and your criminal history. And they do background checks on your credit rating and check out who have a claim on you and all this stuff. And after they do all that, they see if you're eligible. Then they sign the promissory note on the back, send it to the treasury. They give the money. They act like they don't get money. They come after you to get more money. Double entry bookkeeping. And they're double dipping. And not adjusting the balance book according to the generally acceptable accounting principles. This is large. This is huge. This is enormous. It shall, will, and does make a big impact when you include it in your language and verbal combat. Not just verbal combat, but with the paper and the pen. Or with the ink or whatever. So... So my point is, do we actually have a contract or a volunteer agreement? I submit to you that this is a volunteer agreement as it does not fulfill the requirements of a contract. So as we discussed in the earlier section about standing in party of interest in a controversy, the bank does not have standing if it cannot produce proof of claim so you have rights with rights comes responsibilities it is your responsibility to know your rights and enforce them not mine click clack boom so chapter 6 the county recorder's role so as we dive deeper into this process, it is important for you to understand the role of public records. You see, pretty early in the game, people realize that we need to have public records of acts or notices. So it is important for you to understand the role of public records. People realize that we need to have public records of acts or notices. It started with town criers. Hear ye, hear ye. But that's not good enough as towns got larger. So they have courthouses and churches to maintain public records about certain people. But it but it comes to property but when it comes to property 
We also need to have a common place for people to look up public information as it relates to property. The Property Appraiser's Office. County Deed Office. The County Recorder's Office. The County Tax Collector's Office. The County Auctions Office. Civil criminal county circuit civil so especially when it comes to ownership of the property or contest of title or parties of interest so most which is the official records so most people don't understand the importance nor the function of the county recorder's office mmm waka waka so for the record let me try to explain it for you the county recorder is your servant he or she works for you he or she is hired to maintain public record or they're committing treason that's it he cannot make any legal determination on the legitimacy of your paperwork or they're committing treason a breach of oath of office to serve the public in the public record they can't discriminate against what documents you can or cannot put up so he cannot advise you on whether or what you are doing is legal as long as it follows proper formats and standards he must record your files proper format and proper standards so that's the only catch so you can record anything you can go in and file an affidavit saying today the sky is blue over my house and he must file it or you can say notice of banks default giving the bank notice they have defaulted before the bank the trustee or anyone else can do anything on your property they must consult the county records on your property it's a journal of the history of your house and all notices posted on it Ooh, that's it what is recorded does not make it legal right true or whatever it's just a record what is this important why is this important in the foreclosure process it's about giving notice if you are giving notice and despite the notice you do it anyway then you knowingly are entering into a contract with the other party who gave notice. For example, no trespassing. If you cross this line, I will charge you a fee of $100. If they cross the line, they have agreed to the contract. So if you post a notice on county records, no one can say no one told me that. It's there in public record. So all the paperwork we are doing with the bank needs to be documented and properly filed with the recorder to give all interested parties notice of what's going on. That's why you file a warranty deed at the county recorder's office. It gives notice to everyone that you have hereby transferred and conveyed your title ownership of the property to another party. So that's why the bank has to file a notice of default so everyone can know that the terms of the contract has been defaulted. That's why you can file a notice of bank default so everyone including the bank can know that the deed of trust is broken. Problems with the county recorder's office. Some recorders have a false sense of grandeur. They think they are actually the gatekeeper of legal documents and can determine what is right and what is not. In my opinion, only four people who can do, do legal determination is plaintiff, claim, affidavit, defendant, claim, affidavit, attorney, out at law, outlaw, and judge. So anyone else will be considered practicing law without a license. Judge can't make no legal determination for you too. We practice in law from the bench. So take out the fourth. So the bar, the British Admiralty realm, 
Association holds an exclusive copyright on this. Yes, copyright. That's why you have to enter the bar to practice law. You were buying into their worldwide franchise. Notice why they call themselves at law and not in law. They like they're against it. They're at the water but not in the water. So they are not really practicing real law. They're practicing at law and barely touching it. Just the color of law. Go to Wikipedia and look up color of law. Fascinating reading. I know exactly what it is, but I may need to sharpen my sword. So if a county recorder chooses to enter into legal determination, politely ask the following questions. One, is there anything wrong with the format of my documents? Two, are you making legal determination on my documents? Three, are you practicing law without a license? Four, are you willing to be named a defendant in my civil action for obstructing my rights to legal due process? So if you run into any grief with the county recorder, it's really very simple. All you need to do is to write the county legal counsel with an intent to litigate. Show them the papers you intend to file against them and ask if they would like to proceed. Give them 72 hours, 3 days to respond if they don't want to record your documents. See how fast they run, especially when you can provide both an affidavit, a witness, and a video recording of the event that transpired. Affidavit, witness, and recording. So be prepared to follow through with your intent if they fail. Especially since in most cases time is of the essence. Their obstruction has real punitive damage associated with their obstruction because they damage you from doing what you need to do. You are entitled to three times damages. Punitive damages. So go ahead, make my day. Clint Eastwood as Dirty Harry. So here's my request from you. I've taken the time to educate you for free. Here's what I want to ask of you in return, seriously. If you run into any county recorder who gives you grief, then stand up to them. Fight them to the fullest extent of the law so you can help everyone else in your county. File suit against them. Put them in their right place. They are our servants. You have rights. It is your responsibility to enforce your rights. Anyone who gets in the way of your God-given rights, hallelujah, to justice is doing what's called obstruction of justice. So when you stand in truth, you are as immovable as the mountains. But, but, I don't want to perpetrate more problems in our litigious, litigi litigious society. If you don't believe what you are doing is worth fighting for, then don't start the process. 11, 11 a.m. Hallelujah. Hu anu. So this process is a commitment. Once you do it, you do it till you get your house. As well as all the monies you've ever paid to these guys. Wait a minute. What did you say? You mean I can ask for my money back all those years? Yep. So chapter 7, claiming all monies owed to you. Listen, let's use the stolen car example. If we can prove that you've been making payments to someone who sold you stolen goods, do you think you can ask for your money back? Yes. So why is it different here? It's not. Remember, they've already been paid at least twice. Now that you've caught them in the fraud, don't you think you are entitled to remedy? Yes. Three times the blow. Once you've done this administrative process, you have what's called prima facie evidence. It's supposed to be a prima facie a e at the end. So prim or prima facie in Latin. So prima facie evidence. So prima facie Latin expression meaning on its first appearance. 
or at first sight. The literal translation would be at fir at first at first face prima face facie face primaire primaire face so first face prima face primaire face facie face both in the ablative case so it is used in modern legal english to signify that on first examination a matter appears to be self-evident from the facts from the face off rip no need to proceed in common law jurisdictions prima facie denotes evidence which unless rebutted would be sufficient to prove a particular proposition or fact so you have first-hand evidence of their fraud first-hand evidence prima facie proof therefore you can prove to any judge trustee that you have been defrauded citing the analogy that brought a stolen car and wants your money back so you've been defrauded they try to make me look like I have a fraudulent claim in my own stuff so of course this is optional but I intend to do this for myself I mean damn I've paid hundreds of thousands over the years now I can ask for the money back as triple damages worth a shot remember what can they come back to you at can they provide the three points of proof of claim you were asking for you've given them ample opportunity to prove up you've got an ironclad administrative process with no contest from the bank in other words once you've done this process and properly notify the bank the bank can contest or rebut your claim so I know most of you are probably in a difficult financial place most of these problems we are experiencing in our economy today is directly caused by these guys and the little guy always get screwed like the Pope and the little boy it's just a poke in the bun he says just a walk in the park like Mr. Rogers neighborhood and the little guy always get punked so I don't know about you but I am done with being punked or screwed I want what's rightfully and lawfully mine I encourage you to do whatever it takes to learn your rights and fight for your your rightful remedy in court three times your payments over the years could make a huge difference to your family's quality of life suing the crap out of the banks of course that is totally up to you most people are just happy to have their house back so in chapter 8 the feeling in your stomach as you were reading this many of you are probably having that feeling in your stomach like you like you are about to go into a fight a combat war it's just too good to be true war look I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm just giving you information so you can start your own research. I have a coaching program which coaches people through the process if they want to get started. But for the most case, all the information you need on how to do it is spelled out on his site. So my desire is his desire is to help us on the process so we can teach each other create to create borrow modify our own documents create borrow and modify our own documents so look them up on the internet and adapt it to your own needs my coaching program also have all the legal documents I draw up and compiled you can also contact me Malakizadak Israel um, at God lives in our heart at hotmail.com whichever one works for you so all my dispute letters rebuttals who to notify when how etc 
So for more information, come to my etc. website at this if you're interested. So do your own research. Go to YouTube. Search for Jerry Kane, Winston Strout, Sam Davis. Do not take my word for it. So until you know in your heart and mind that what you are about to embark on is right, don't do it. This is a pretty intensive and time-consuming undertaking, promise, to perform. But if you do this, you will be free of your mortgage for the rest of your life. Let's say the average home is 200000 Imaging making 200000 in cash in 90 days. So imagine making 200000 in cash in 90 days. Isn't that worth a shot? Fear is natural, especially if it's new and unknown. The only way to overcome fear of the unknown is to make the subject known through, through education. That's why I told you, you need to own the process. Once you own the process, even if they come at you with lawyers, you can just laugh at them. So perspective. Let's put this into perspective. Perceive this. For you, it's a big deal. It's damn scary. In your mind, you were thinking to yourself, you could lose your house, your reputation, and possibly go to jail. For the person working as a junior clerk at the bank, whose job is to stamp one file after another of the hundreds of thousands of pending foreclosures on his desk, do you, do you think he cares? To him, it's just stamp. Next. Stamp. Next. To the lawyer who is processing your file for pending foreclosure, do you think he's got any emotional energy vested in your case? To him is just stamp. Process. Next. Stamp. Process. Next. Stamp. Next. So why should you fear that? You were dealing with drones, robots. Whereas you are Whereas you are a intelligent person full of imagination trying to exert your rights and saving your home full of discernment. So in a fight, I would bet on the homeowner over a drone any day. Take the emotion out of this. To them it's just a job. To you it should be just a game. A game you intend to win. That's why I call this book the Thousand Paper Cut Technique. The way to default a bureaucrat is with the thousand paper cuts. So try to resist adding salt to those cuts. That's just mean. <laughs> a thousand paper cuts. You just got a paper cut, but not just a paper cut, but a thousand. So chapter Chapter 9, chop them up with paperwork. So the, t <laughs> the chopper's on the table. With the pen, put them in the pen. So chapter 9, the credit bureau and your future in banking. So the credit bureau, the credit agencies play an important role in reporting and tracking the status and standing of your various financial activities. So banks rely on these agencies' service almost exclusively in matters of future loans. Banks are forbidden to contact each other directly to talk about your account. It's a direct violation of your confidentiality. So learning to work with these agencies is very important. Congress created the Privacy Act in 1974 and established procedures necessary to report information about you. These credit bureaus must follow the APA Administrative Procedures Act. So remember, remember, offer, then counter offer, rebuttal, same deal. So that's why they are required to answer your dispute letters within 30 days. If they cannot respond within 30 days of an inquiry, they are to remove any derogatories from their files in response to your inquiry. So what this means is, is 
if you do if you do my thousand paper cut process to claim your house will that permanently stain your record here's what you must understand the credit agency's job is to keep accurate information if the information cannot be verified it has to be expunged so if you were the one who is giving them instructions with proof of legal due process and if they do not comply there's huge legal recourse available to you including the ability to file suit against them for massive amounts of money for punitive damages to your good name no one wants that so not only that the Federal Trade Commission is set up to protect your rights in these matters because they deal with unfair practices and all that. So I've created a process that will basically clean up any derogatories as a result of these actions. It goes like this. You've administered the default notice to the bank and notified them of their lack of claim. You will have then filed this notice at the county courthouse as a matter of public record when you default them. So all you need to do is to then notify the credit bureau that the debt in this matter has been settled. So the credit bureau now has a choice. They can choose to believe you in your administrative process which is 100% lawful as we've illustrated or they can choose to ignore you. So you've administered the default notice to the bank and notified them of their lack of claim. You will have then filed this notice at the county courthouse as a matter of public record. All you need to do is to then notify the credit bureau that the debt in this matter has been settled. So if they ignore you in your reporting letter, you can include an offer. Remember offer slash counter offer? If you can simply offer them a choice if they choose to ignore your notice to mark the note as settled, then you include an offer for them to pay you $1 million for damages caused to your good name. So I've included a sample letter of my credit reporting notice below so you can see what I mean. So let's say they still ignore your offer. Remember, under the Administrative Procedures Act, APA, an offer not rebuked is an offer accepted. So once this is set in motion, then you can bring legal action to them. Don't worry, it's easier than you think. Here is a simple dispute letter I've written that is in my kit. All right. So George Tran, this address, blah, 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 the date, the three credit unions right here. TransUnion, Equifax, Experion at their real address. Oh yeah, also um, a copy go to the Federal Trade Commission as well because they govern them three. So reference, Bank of America, Countrywide Mortgage Loan Number, Deed of Trust Number. So you put the loan number here and you put the deed of trust number right there so this is a legal notice notice this document is not intended to threaten harass hinder or obstruct any lawful operations it is for the purposes of obtaining lawful remedy as is provided by law so greetings this is my second letter in regards to this matter this item in my credit report is currently in a civil action at Cir Circuit Court of the Oregon Judicial Circuit in and for Lane County, state of whatever state you're from, Divi civil division or criminal division, whatever division you're in. You put the description of the court there on whatever date. So case number, etc. So the lender in this matter was unable to provide proof of claim for their security instrument and have exhausted their, their administrative remedies. Therefore, they no longer have any claim on my property because they exhausted their remedies. So this procedure is done in full accordance with the Administrative Procedures Act 
1946 United States Code, Title V, Section 500, and the Federal Rules of Civil Procedures. So please find the enclosed notice of default filed at the county recorder's office documenting the lender's default and release of claim. So you will also find enclosed full reconveyance filed at the county recorder's office for the property in question. So I am therefore instructing you to mark this item as settled in full. Should you choose not to comply with my instructions within 30 days, you agree to contract with me through tacit agreement for harm done to my good name through your inaccurate reporting for a sum of $1 million. In addition, I will, I will have no choice but to name you a co-defendant for this matter in my action. Consider this your legal notice and demand. Please respond in writing within 30 days to avoid unnecessary unpleasantries. Failure to respond equates to tacit consent to my offer under the Administrative Procedures Act. So you're warning them and you're letting them know ahead of time what you're interested in, what may potentially be used as collateral. You know, what is being claimed, what is the invoice, what is the damage. You're pretty much warning them that you'll take everything of theirs if they don't respond. You know, before they don't respond and you do it. You warn them, then you do it. You warn them, then you do it. You notify them, then you do it. Let them know everything you're going to do uh, before you do it if it works in your favor. Let them know it all. I'm going to put you on UCC as a debtor, and this constitutes a, a, a power of attorney agreement and a security agreement, and you waive all your rights to defend yourself in court, and you cannot say nothing in court. Yeah, you can use all that against them. You warn them, then you do it. So in addition, I will have no choice but to name you a co-defendant for this matter in my civil action. So please respond in writing or this is agreement. This so I recommend you pass this notice to your senior supervisor, manager, CFO, CEO, or management team. So this is a very serious matter. So future business with the bank. But will this affect your ability to get any future loans? Yes, the credit agency will eventually submit. You just have to follow the process and be persistent with your follow up. You will have to commit to cleaning up your good name. My name and my character means everything to me. So if the credit agency still ignore you, you can then initiate a lawsuit for damages as outlined in your offer letter. Trust me, this will get people running scared really quick. So regardless of what the bank says, it is irrelevant. You've got lawful proof that they are in default. They have, exalted their, they have exhausted their remedy and cure. Opportunity to cure is over with. So once you clean the record with the agencies, then you were just like where you were before. You were in debt. Now you're clear. Clear title. When done right, this should have little to no negative impact on your credit record, nor your ability to do business with future banks. So remember, banks can't talk to each other. They have to rely on the credit agencies. Once the credit agency issue, issue is cleaned up, then you are free to contract with other banks. I would not advise going back to the same bank. They will likely have a record of the transaction that transpired. But yes, you should be able to get loans from other banks. Chapter 10 Taking Action and Getting Help so when I started this process, I was only interested in getting my house free and clear. As I dug deeper, I got both excited and frankly very angry. I started to think about the millions of people out there who need help too. 
exactly that's what brought me into this so I started to think about the millions of them out there that need help so all those poor people who've had their house stolen from them exactly as soon as I completed my administrative process I began writing this article it quickly became a book by the way as of writing it t it's taken me two days to write this book so you will excuse me if it's not polished I don't claim to be a guru at this. More learned men can have credit to coming up with the process including Jerry Kane, John Stewart, TJ Mars, Time Tim Turner, and many others. I just internalized their information and systemized it so more people can follow the process step by step. And I know their whole process. So I've complied, I compiled the course as well as over 24 legal documents I've used or created in my process that I could make available if you are interested. It is the same and improved documents I use for my process. So I will also be offering a document preparation service so that you can simply give me your vital info and my assistant can just fill out the docs for you. Trust me, it's taken, it's taken me many, many hours to fill out these documents. They are pretty intense and not for the weak of mind. So for information about these offers, please come to my website at uh, free and clear in clear in 90.com so I hope you've enjoyed this book please forward this to as many of your friends as possible we need to all wake up so warning do not do this I would prefer you not start this process than to do it half ass firstly you must be convinced with conviction that what you are doing is right or you will fail Secondly, you must know the process inside out and from the outside on in. Own it or you will fail. Thirdly, you must be willing to take it to the end. Never start a fight that you are not willing to finish. If you do this and, and back out halfway, it's like a fly hitting a windscreen. <laughs> not pretty. So this process is very time intensive. There's, a, there's lots and lots of paperwork you have to create and file and track. You have to come to a decision on your own as to whether fighting for what is rightfully yours is worth doing. If you choose to do my coaching program, there is no refund. I know my process works. It requires a commitment to your personal success. It takes commitment for personal responsibility. You are responsible for your own education. If you don't know it, figure it out, research, ask questions, and read. My motto is this, there is no failure. I either succeed or I die trying. Or as Yoda, Yoda, Yehuda puts it, there is no try. There is do or do not. There is no try. Isn't it time for you to take a stand? Hallelujah, So now we go into the appendix because he pretty much taught us the whole process in a nutshell. So this is a process. So this is a process used by judicial as well as administrative to fight the bank. Some people advocate just using administrative processes, Jerry Kane. But I recommend you also throw in the initial judicial process as well, in other words, sue the bank. The advantage of invoking a judicial petition is that you now have the court working for you. It makes all your paperwork so much easier. Later in the process, you will be needing to file your paperwork with the county recorder's office. In my experience, Having a current court case on this subject makes your filing go much smoother. You see, some recorders think they are God. They are not. They are public servants. This means they serve you. Their job is to file information as a matter of public record. They cannot make legal determination, in other words, whether what you are doing is legal or not, 
However, some people have had a hard time having their paperwork filed, and I have had um, in the past with certain documents that I was doing that did not follow their guidelines and standards. You mean the, like the looks and the borders and, you know, stuff like that. So you may want to keep your thing very simple and plain and um, similar to their documents. Look up copies of them and make them similar, not the same. So with the backing of a pending lawsuit against the bank, should a recorder be stupid enough to challenge your paperwork? Not only are they in trouble for making a legal determination, you can nail them for obstruction of justice. Nasty. No one wants to go there. So the rule is, we always want to stay in honor, be truthful, and be reasonable. We never want to appear to be bullies, a con artist, or, or someone who is out to cheat the system. You are an honest person looking to find the truth and discharge all of your debt. From the roots of evil, the accounting books. So that's all. So phase zero, document preparation. So this phase will consist the bulk of the work for you. Besides educating yourself on the process and your rights, you will need to compile the appropriate documents you will need to, to prepare your documents as outlined in the next section. So in phase one, launching the process. So write and send a certified letter to your bank, a certified written request, to your bank requesting the original wet ink signature promissory note. That would be the first thing you ask. So this is called certified written request. Requesting for the original wet ink signature, C001 initial letter to lender. So this will be the first letter you send to the lender. So file with the county court a petition, C02 legal civil uh, petition. Wait, they will always send you a copy. So they always send you a copy. The trap is set. They are screwed because now you can rebut that um, um, response because you want the original wet ink signature, not a copy which can be counterfeit, easily printed. Next, we want to protect your good name with the credit reporting agencies. Some people are militant about these guys. I believe you can have, have them work for you instead of against you. So if you are already in default, then there is already a de derogatory against your name on this matter. It is your job to clean it up. Since you filed a court case against the bank, the derogatory must be reported as disputed. So be sure to prepare and file your notice to the credit reporting agencies because they got to get a copy. So C002A dispute letter to, to send to all credit reporting agencies. So phase two, rebuke, object, rebut, and pressing the issue. So once you receive the phony copy, here they are hoping you'd shut up and continue making payments like a good little slave. You will want to rebuke them. Did, did they give you what you had requested? No. That's all the question is. I don't care about what they did right, what they did send, what almost seemed like the answer. Did they give you what you had requested? And if they did on some, which ones did they not? So send them notice to rebuke them, notifying them they not notifying them they not comply they did not comply with your request. Give them another 14 days because this is a notice of re uh, non response, notice of um, tacit acquiescence, a notice of fault or default. So in the second letter, 04, second letter to lender, ask for more discovery, ask for more information which you know they cannot produce certified mail so along with this letter you were to include the notice to modify the deed of trust the following unsigned the modification deed of trust the substitution of trustee notice 
the revocation of power of attorney or rescindal of signature. So notice of intention to modify dot the deed of trust. So the following unsigned. So wait 14 days. So wait 14 days. They will likely send you some stupid letter or another copy of the deed of trust. Is it what you have asked? No. You said you're going to be modifying the deed of trust. You're substituting the trustee that you are revoking the power of attorney. So now we have shown that we have been very reasonable up to this point. We've showed good faith. So they are the ones who are in dishonor. They refuse to show the, the proof. Now you have cause of action. This is critical. Without cause, you have no standing to bring forth any action against them. That's like claiming you have a lien on something without having a security agreement. So, so at this point, I would file a motion to compel with the court. A motion to compel performance to produce motion for production motion for discovery so you can now show to the court that you've tried to be reasonable but the bank is being a jerk you are begging the court to intervene so file your motion to compel C005 dash motion to compel now you have the court on your back should the bank move to a trustee sale you can present multiple evidence to block the sale, including a pending um, suit on this matter. So a stay on trustee sale. So no one would want to touch you or you object to trustee sale upon proof exhibits. So feel free to add the auctioneer, the trustee or anyone else to your suit if they want to play see how they run run so phase three so all right filing your paperwork they have dishonored the contract and have exhaust, exhausted their administrative remedy because they're not saying anything else and you are notifying them of their default which you want to do throughout the way and get that recorded in the county deed office so file the notice of default in the new deed of trust with the substitution of trustee, revocation of power of attorney, and modification of the deed of trust. So file that. Record the new deed of trust which includes substitution of trustee, revocation of power of attorney. So this is a convenient way to sneak your new documents to the county recorder without them giving you grief. So with this, with this step here, you've effectively removed the bank from having any power to foreclose on you because the trustee had the power and the bank was controlling the trustee which is controlling your property. So no title insurance company will insure the transfer because they cannot and do not have clean title. So, in other words, if they sell the house, you can and will come after the title insurance company with the lawsuit and win. So, send the notice of default to the bank, the original trustee, and foreclosing trustee. So, be sure to make sure if MERS is the beneficiary. Be sure to notify them too. Be sure to make sure if MERS is the beneficiary because sometimes they're not. Be sure to notify them too. So send a letter to your friendly trustee telling them the note has been satisfied. So send a letter to your friendly trustee, the one that you chose, telling them the note has been satisfied while it's in your hand in full because the bank was not able to produce valid proof of claim. So you got a satisfaction agent now, which is your trustee, which will record a satisfaction into the record and the release of the mortgage. So send a letter to your friendly trustee
telling them the new deed of trust has been satisfied in full. Wait seven days. Do a full reconveyance back to you. With this last step, you've removed the lien from your property from the public record. Congratulations, your property is free and clear. So phase four, protection. Now that you have your property free and clear, what's to stop the bank of ignoring your administrative process and steamroll over you anyway? Hold on one second, y'all. Hope you guys are learning a lot. So, hold on one sec, y'all. folder here with me right now. Alright, that's cool. Alright. So one, if you receive a notice of trustee sale, you will respond to the trustee and anyone else showing them copies of your civil suit and motion to compel your reconveyance and notice of default copies of your civil suit if you're doing a quiet title action a motion to compel performance your reconveyance and notice of default so this should send them packing be sure to notify them that they will be named as defendant on your suit so make sure you warn them and tell them that also be sure to include some teeth in your notice if they wish to play they each agree to pay you $10,000 in a negative averment. In other words, you were saying you have the right to sell uh, in other words, you were saying you have the right to sell my house even after I showed you proof. I challenge you to prove it. So in other words, you were saying if you have the right to sell my house even after I prove even after I showed you proof, I challenge you to prove it in a negative averment. If you can't, you agree to each to each owe me $10,000 per person, per offense, per crime. So if they still want to play, then name them as defendants in your suit. Which you can easily modify and do. So the beauty with the negative averment action is that it is so new, few people know what it is. But it is nasty. The judges and lawyers who know what this is run screaming. It's like a black hole. Anyone caught in its wake gets sucked in and gets named in the action through an administrative process. An affidavit. So essentially you are saying if you can't prove what you are claiming is true, you agree to contract with me and owe me X amount of dollars. So this becomes a self-executing agreement enforceable by law. You can lock up people's, people's and companies' credit rating and corporate credit, which will grind them to a halt. A negative judgment on a lawyer or judge will get them debarred. So who? Me? I don't have it. So next step you need to know is that a lien and trustee action is tied to you, the borrower. Once title is transferred to another party, 
their claim stops. So you would then draw up a private buy-sell agreement with the trust or LLC or limited liability partnership. You then sell the property to this other party on a promissory note, sell it for the same price you bought it for, full price. This way you don't have to deal with taxable events from gains and losses, it evens out. So you will want to convey and grant to the new owner a warranty deed to give him clear title. If you want to be extra careful, you will throw in a mechanics lien and public sale, which puts another level of ownership and separation between you, the bank, and the new owner. A mechanics lien wipes everything out to the new owner. A mechanics lien. So. So congratulations, you now, you now truly are a homeowner, free and clear. So draw up a private agreement, buy or sell agreement with the trust, because you're selling them the house. You then sell the property to this other party on a promissory note, so they promise to pay it to you. So you go ahead and um, what you would call um, uh, give them the extension of the credit under the promissory note for the same price you got it then this way you don't have to deal with taxable events so you will want to to convey and grant to the new owner a warranty deed a deed of trust you see with the um, buy and sell agreement with the promissory note um, and probably with the a, a mortgage well, yeah with a mortgage which is a security agreement a pledge they said mechanics lien a lien is, is a security agreement. Then put a lien on it. So congratulations. You are now a true homeowner free and clear. So we're going to um, be pausing for now. And when we come back, we're going to continue on with damage to your credit. Uh, you know, how to repair that and fix that up and clean it all up. Until then, I hope you guys are enjoying this video. Um, we only have like less than 21 pages left. So um, when we come back, you know, it should be our last video in part three. Shalom, everybody. Love y'all.